we stand, please. Father, we thank you for this day today, for this opportunity to be in your presence, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our midst this morning, that we would sense your presence here, that you'd inhabit the praises of your people this morning. And as the word comes this morning, Lord God, that you would bless and help us just to go deeper with you. So now, Lord, as we worship, we just uh, ask that our hearts would be right and that they would make you smile. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise be you, what the mankind through all anxiety. 
praise you and give you thanks and glory and honor. You are worthy, Lord God. Hallelujah. As we move now into a time of communion, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, speak to our hearts and just help us to remember why we're even here this morning, Lord God. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. If you don't have your communion elements yet, um, they are just outside the doors there of the sanctuary. It's a special time of the service. We've always looked at this as being something not only necessary, but so important for us to ingrain it in our very hearts and minds. Because some things happened at that last supper that Jesus was, was the host of, and they bear mentioning. But before we, before we get any further, Losing all my notes here. <laughs> Before we get any further, I just want to remind, remind you of something that I'm sure you know of. And that is, well, thank you, brother. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sure that you know that when God made everything, he spent a lot of time on creation. He spent seven days to create all the things that are so important to us. We're going to see something tomorrow that's going to be kind of rare. But yet he made that too. And everything he made, we should take advantage of and notice it and praise him and thank him for it. Because he did it. Nobody else could. It's not a matter of natural occurrence. He made it. And as he made it each and every time, he said, it is good. It is good. But then came the Garden of Eden. And we know that Adam and Eve sinned within that garden. At that particular time, God had to change things. And he changed things by banning them from, from the garden because now they were both sinful. They were not allowed to go back in there that's just one of the things that occurred where God's actions were warranted. The next thing that comes to my mind, and I'm not taking this into order, but we know that Nimrod was a, was a fierce warrior. And at the time, he was probably the leader of the, of the world that is known at that time. They all spoke the same language and they're determination to reach God and be like God was to build this tower. And God saw that and he changed the languages of all those people and then spread them around the, around the world. Changed the language. That's something that God did in a universe in a, in a great, magnificent way. But you see, God had to make changes along the way. Now let's take Noah. That situation was something really distressing. He could not find anyone in the world that was worthy of saving. He wanted to kill everyone. That's in the word of God. It's not me. So he made a change there as well. He killed most of the world, but he saved Noah and his family. And we are the result of Noah and his family because everyone else was gone was gone. So you see those things happened and and I mentioned them because of the importance of the communion because during all those all those things that that changed you could refer to that as a, as a change or as, as a new covenant, new ideas that came that God instituted upon the world that was sinful. Now at the last supper we know that Jesus was the host, and he began to lead the, the ceremony. And he broke the bread and prayed for it. In their feastal days, that bread represented a release from Egypt, where they had been slaves for over 400 years. But he took it to a different approach. 
an approach that we all benefit from today. We benefit by that symbolically to take the bread that he said to his disciples who were all present. He said, take and eat. This is my body. Join me, please. Now, the importance of the cup and the blood that we symbolically salute and take should be taken knowing what was written by Moses in Leviticus. I just want to read this to you. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Jesus said, take and drink. This is my blood. Join me. Now is that blood that Jesus gave us was a new covenant. And that new covenant was, was clearly stated, not only in the gospels, but but even, even Paul wrote about it. It provides us with something that was not available until he gave that, that blood in the ceremony. And that is a new covenant of everlasting life. The doorway to heaven, peace, eternal life, whatever you want to call it. That wasn't, but now is because of what he did. Jesus, we thank you for that. Lord, you, you've always been so good for us to watch over us carefully and, and to provide these things that we had no, 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 way, no other way to attain, that, that you had to go through all that suffering for us. You died for us, and now we live for you. We just pray, Lord, you'll continue to bless us and watch over us and teach us, Father, to remember all that which you, which you want us to know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship. You can stand or sit. You are 
praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you for this time of you. In worship, Lord God, I know that you lift our hearts during this time, and uh, we certainly have lifted mine, Lord God. And so now, as we go and we look into your word, Lord God, may you just meet us here, Lord. We love you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, just a, a couple of announcements before we get going this morning with the message. Um, as you guys know already, we have our Thursday night Bible study, and Revelation will be in chapter 13 this week at 7 p.m., and uh, we love having people there. It's, it's great uh, because we allow for people to communicate and to uh, you know, voice their opinions and so on, too, so it's, it's always great to see all the different... Uh, opinions of things come together because it's a very, very difficult chapter, <laughs> very difficult. In fact, 12 was especially difficult, um, but we'll see what uh, the rest of the Revelation has for us. Um, also, uh, we've got our men's breast breakfast coming up on April 20th. Guys, if you've never been, uh, please come out and uh, be with us. We have such a great time. We do a study as well, but the fellowship of the men together is, is a really, really great thing, so it's, it's great to have all the guys there. And then on May 10th, uh, we're hoping to have a little video on this so you can kind of see the works of the facility that they have in Schomburg uh, called Feed Our Starving Children. And uh, it's, it's really a nice um, opportunity to serve. If you've never gotten out there and served and you're a little tentative of things like that, this is such a great way to get involved because there's no pressure on you to witness to somebody or uh, you know do something out of your comfort zone. It's basically just set up like a... Uh, a line and someone starts with a, a box or whatever and they pass things along and you put your portion in by the time it gets down to the end it's a big box and we tape it up and stuff and it gets shipped uh, to kids that are hungry kids that don't have food like we regularly have here more food than we could ever possibly want <laughs> right so uh, yeah it's uh, that's going to be a great opportunity it's a Friday night it's two hours and uh we would love to have as many people uh, turn out for that as possible. It's such a great time to serve. And so with that, we're going to uh, look into the message today. Uh, I've titled it, God's Imperfect Men. And in particular, today we'll focus on Jacob. You know, when it, it comes time for Pastor Jeff to be out of town, and he is, by the way, with his wife uh, Maureen, and they're down, I think, Fort Myers with Jeff's brothers, just chilling out and having a little bit of rest, which is, is so needed for him. He doesn't get that many ch chances to do that, and so uh, he'll be gone this week and possibly next, too. We'll see how that all works out. But, uh, you know, um, when it comes time for me to teach, I'm not working my way through a book. You know, like Jeff, Pastor Jeff, every Sunday, he knows, okay, it's this portion of First Corinthians, then it's the next portion, then it's the next portion. But, you know, I always, I sit weeks ahead of time, and, I, and as soon as I find out about the fact that he's going to be gone, I'm like, what am I going to teach on? Lord, please speak to my heart, because it's hard to just pull something out of thin air, you know? Um, and so he has. He has met me uh, several times in that way. And uh, this time, I think he did with, with this message, too. You know, we're all very imperfect, are we not? Um, you know, yes, we, st <laughs> we strive for pe perfection. Yes, the Lord wants us to be perfect, but we are miles from perf perfect, you know. And so uh, I was looking into the lives of some of the different uh, Bible characters, the important ones. And of course, you know, Abraham, then came Isaac, then came Jacob. And it's, uh, he he's a very important character in the Bible, but he was very imperfect. So we're going to look at some of that today. Let's go to uh, Genesis. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be uh, basically in Genesis uh, 32 and 33 and kind of flipping around. But I've got all the verses in, on the screen, so you don't have to flip too much. But if you just go to Genesis 32 for now, uh, verse 24, we'll get started. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. 
And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. That's a very interesting thing. Um, but let's pray before we go any further. Father, we want to thank you for this uh, day today, this, this morning. Lord, this message that you've given me and we now uh, all share together in, I pray that it would touch hearts. I think we'll all see ourselves in this message, Lord God, and I think we will all wind up um, doing everything we can to draw close to you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would just meet us here this morning, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. And so, you know, when we look into the, the life of Jacob, uh, there's so many different aspects to look at in his life. But today, we're going to see how Jacob is sometimes good and sometimes bad, how he is sometimes strong, sometimes weak. You know, he would rise one moment to the occasion, and then he'd fall right afterwards. And so his character is inconsistent, um, as ours can be too. Uh, and it was like that for, for Jacob everywhere. Yet, in spite of all of that, he was a chosen instrument of God. And, you know, that certainly reminds us of David, too, you know, who God said he was a man after God's own heart, and yet he was very imperfect and did some things that none of us would probably ever do, and yet God said, you know, he's a man after my own heart. So God has room uh, for all of us, and that should give us encouragement this morning, and that's, that's really what I hope comes from this message today. So in the text that we just read in Genesis 32, you know, we could see... Um, that what happens there for Jacob is kind of a turning point. But to understand what happened, why he was wrestling with God, um, we, we have to do a little backing up, a little check here to find out what brought him to that point. And so, you know, in this point in his life, he is um, unhappy. He's filled with fears and doubts. He, um, he literally uh, has a physical and a spiritual encounter with God. And, you know, right away we think, wait a minute, um, what do you mean God? Didn't it just say he wrestled with a man? Well, man is capitalized there. It's a, it's a capital M. And, um, you know, Jesus, the Bible tells us, was there from the beginning. You know, and so um, he is the creator He's always been. So when we see appearances of him in the Old Testament, we call that a, a, a theophany or a Christophany, or sometimes it's just referred to as you know, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, meaning he's always been there before he came in the flesh. And so um, I want to show a, a verse to you from Hosea 12, 3 through 5, just to convince you that this man he wrestled with was none other than Jesus. He was, he was wrestling with God. And so it says in Hosea 12, 3 through 5, he took his brother by the heel. Now we're, we've backed up all the way to his birth, right? He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. So that's part of what we'll be talking about here. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and he spoke to us, that is, the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. So there's no question that who Jacob was wrestling here with was none other than a pre-incarnate Christ. And so, you know, we can be completely confident that, you know, Jesus has existed from the beginning of time. Let us make man in our own image. Well, who's the us and the our if it's not the Trinity present, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so in John, uh, this verses I, I memorized a long time ago because this was in my early life as a, a Christian, this was so important to me. In John 1, 1 through 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and was God. He was in the beginning with God. So no doubt in our minds, Jesus has always been and that Jacob encounters Jesus here. Um, in Revelation 19, 13, I just wanted to tell you too that you can look that up and um, you know 
in case you're wondering who the Word is, because in John, in the beginning was the Word. Well, wait a minute, the Word, who's that? Well, if you go to Revelation 19, 13, you're going to find out that the name for Jesus there is the Word of God. So Jesus is the Word. And um, Jacob had this wrestling match with, with Jesus that night. Um, I don't know about you, but I cannot picture what that would have looked like. Seriously. How, what kind of wrestling match was this? You know, I was looking for a backdrop for the slide this morning, and I'm, I'm looking at like Roman Greco, um, Greco. Sorry, again, Roman Greco wrestling, thank you. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of stand-up type wrestling. Was it that? Were they on the ground rolling around? Was it, you know, you think, okay, was it just spiritual maybe? Or was it physical? Well, it was pretty physical, and we'll see why in just a moment. But um, it's an interesting thing. I, I just cannot picture that. And so, but to Jacob's credit, he would not let go of Jesus. And, I, you know, you think, uh, this is such an interesting thing. When you were a kid, um, did, did you ever wrestle with somebody who was younger than you? David, I know you did with your brothers and so on. You wrestle with a younger brother or a sister or something like that, right? And, and it's all fun for a little bit and then, you know, you're gaining the advantage. You can do pretty much anything you want with them. You're pushing their head down. You're doing all this stuff. And finally, they slide down your leg and they grab onto your leg. And then you're walking like this, right? Dragging the little tyke up around with you. Um, and, you know, they just will not quit. And that's what Jacob was in this, in this particular case, you know. So I have to ask, wait a minute. How did he get here? Why is he hanging on to Jesus, wrestling with Jesus? Um, so we're going to look back to where it all began. So uh, a little flashback to Genesis 25, uh, verses 19 through 21. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, uh, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord uh, for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. Rebecca, his wife, conceived. So Rebecca, Isaac's wife, like Abraham and Sarah, like Sarah, um, was barren, you know, for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, the Lord was doing something. He was working with them. So Isaac pleads with the Lord in prayer that um, God would bless him with the child, as anyone would probably, who wants to have children and can't. And so I think that's another thing that we can look at to say prevailing prayer makes a difference. If you hang in there, you continue to pray, nothing's getting answered. You don't give up. You just keep praying. Uh, we can never give up praying. So then in Genesis 25, 22 through 23, it says, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, now she's talking to the Lord, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Keep that in the back of your mind. The older shall serve the younger. So now we see that the struggle here that uh, Rebecca has foreshadowed the struggle between two nations. And we'll see who they are in just a Well, I can tell you. They're the Edomites and the Israelites. Um, and some more on that later. But I, I think this also kind of represents a struggle for each of us that we go through uh, regularly. Um, and, you know, we're aware of the struggle with, within us. There's always this flesh and spirit struggle. Um, Paul went through this as well, you know, in uh, Romans chapter 7, you know, the things that he said in 7.15, he said, for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate to do, that I do. So there's this constant struggle within us, the flesh and the spirit. The spirit is willing, right? But the flesh is weak, it says. Sometimes that just happens to us. We can have our best days and we're on top of the world and we're really doing everything obediently to the Lord and the next day something happens and we step outside of that and we think to ourselves, at least I do, what is wrong with me? Why am I still struggling with this? I've known the Lord for like 40 years now. How is that possible that I still don't, it still hasn't saturated enough? Um, and so 
Um, then in Genesis 25, verses 24 through 26, it says, So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so that his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Okay, here's another one that's hard to picture. Honestly, twins come out, and a hand comes out and grabs the heel of Esau. I, it's what it says. I didn't make it up. Uh, it's scripture. So... A very strange thing, you know, Isaac got his blessing, but he also, with the blessing, got some problems because these twins that Rebecca bore, uh, very different. And we've seen that in families too, you know, you think, how is that possible? You know, I have four kids and this one's like that and that one's like that and that one's like that. How is that possible? They're all from, you know, me and my wife. What's going on here? Why so different? Uh, well, that's God. That is God, just the way that he creates. And so... You know, Esau, as a baby even, was red and hairy. I can't picture that, but you know, what do you do when you see a baby like that? Oh, how cute. <laughs> oh, how interesting. <laughs> what do you say? You know, you better come up with some words right then. But he's this little red, hairy baby. And then Jacob seems to be fair-skinned. And I'll show you where it says that, but it seems like he's completely different. Not hairless necessarily, but not like Esau, not hairy, not red. He was a fair-skinned child. And so, um, you know, even at, at birth, that's just showing, you know, God and uh, the nature of things and how he does things, how different in his creation. And so in Genesis 25, 27 through 28, it says, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So dad's favorite is Esau. Um, he's a skilled hunter. He's an outdoorsman. He's a rugged type. He's a man's man. And Isaac identifies with that. Jacob is kind of a mama's boy. Uh, he likes to hang out in the kitchen. He, you know... He, he cooks, he's mild-mannered, and uh, he's kind of the indoor type. And so the problem in this family is beginning right here, playing favorites. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced any of that in your life, but that can be devastating to the, the growth and the life of a child when there's favoritism uh, between a, a mother and a father. So in Genesis 25, 29 through 33, it says, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came home, uh, came in from the field. He was weary, and Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I'm weary. Same red stew. So apparently, Jacob makes a mean red stew, and Esau wants some. Therefore, his name was called Edom, and that's where the Edomites came from. Esau, Edom, Edomites. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. I mean, we say that when we're really hungry. We're not about to die, but, you know, like when you're so hungry, it's like, oh my gosh, I need to eat something. I'm so hungry. So what is this birthright to me? Says flippantly. And then Jacob answered, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob uh, gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Okay, he comes in from the field. He's been hunting all day. He's weary. He's tired. He's starving. And Jacob sees his chance, chance to, uh, you know, show his selfish nature and try and gain something over his brother. And so he talks about his birthright and, and gets him to give it over to him. You know, Esau's response was just, who cares? Just give me some food. I'm hungry. Well, that was a very, very tragic and sincere, uh, serious mistake for Esau. So you got to understand, what is the birthright? What's the value of it? So first, it would make you to be the head of the household after dad, of course. Second, you would be the priest of the family. That's something I didn't realize or consider. 
you would take a spiritual role in the family. Third, you would receive a double portion of the inheritance. Interesting, you know, that's one way to have division within a family, right? You get twice as much and you get just a half of that, you know, half of the, the other half. Fourth, you would inherit the richest land and the best of the land. And fifth, you would receive the blessing of God upon you and your family. Esau throws it all away because he's hungry. That's a very tragic mistake. But does that in any way sound familiar to you? Because people constantly throw away good lives for sex, drugs, alcohol, um, you name it. They surrender to the flesh in a moment. And the consequences can be so tragic. We've had pastors of huge churches that get caught up in it, and next thing you know, they've given away their entire ministry, and their, their ministry is devastated because of it. So, you know, as we look at Jacob's life, we can see that, you know, this was a man that felt uh, as long as he could help himself, there was no real reason to look, for God, look to God for help. And, and that also is a very, very tragic mistake. And so we see these tendencies with Jacob right here. It was prophesied while he was still in the womb that the younger would serve, would, um, the older would serve the younger. Now, don't you think that Rebecca would have told the family this and everybody might know this at least the parents would know right um, but no Jacob and Rebecca get into trouble here so Isaac is at this point in time is very old he's near death and um, he says to Esau one day go hunt and um, make me some food the food that I love you know so I guess he could cook too or whatever so go get me whatever his his thing was you know whether it was a bird or it was a lamb or whatever uh, but I want that food and so Rebecca overhears that, right? And she instructs Jacob to swindle his father for his blessing. So that's interesting too, right? The birthright has one set of uh, value to it, but there's also a blessing that, Jake, that um, Isaac is going to give here near the end of his life, and that has significance as well. But of course, now, what do you think about Rebecca? She overhears this and advises her child to go swindle her brother and her husband. So she has got some problems too. Um, let's read in Genesis 27, 8 through 14. It says, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kinds of goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father and... Uh, that he may eat, and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. There's the fair skin part. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to, uh, to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse upon, uh, on myself and not a blessing. But look, to, look what Rebekah says to him. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice. Go and uh, get them for me. And so, you know, he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And he, um, his mother made savory food such as his father loved. So deception, um, cunningness going on here in trying to um, deceive now Isaac so that Jacob can also get the blessing. And so... Let's backtrack for one quick second. In Genesis 25, 23, we talked about, we already read this, but the Lord said to her, two nations are in your room, two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So there's two elements going on there. But we know that um, they should have believed God's promise. It was given to Rebecca while the, the babies were still in her womb. The promise was given Apparently, she didn't believe it, and she took things into her own hands. Jacob has a chance to uh, get out of it, and she just says, hey, just obey me. If there's a curse, I'll take the curse. Um, another very serious curse for her, as we'll discuss. Is it possible, too, that Isaac didn't trust God? 
I just, it's just, I'm just pondering out loud, okay? You can think about this. Um, Rebecca had to have told him that the older will serve the younger, right? Husband and wife, she gets this message from the Lord. She's going to tell Isaac. And yet, what does he want to do? He wants to bless his favorite, Esau. And so, you know, it seems like no one in this story was willing to wait for God to do his work. They're all taking these matters into their own hands um, to try and make things happen. And so there we see the battle of the spirit and the flesh. We know these things. We do some of this stuff too. You know, we're, we're waiting on God, we're waiting on God, but then you feel like, I've got to do something. I have to do something. And we move without completely waiting for the Lord. And as we know, you know, Rebecca and Jacob, they were able to fool Isaac and receive the blessing. Um, so Jacob kind of compromised his honor and his integrity, and he allowed his mother to lead him into sin. And people do that. They allow other people to lead them into sin as well. Um, he tried to get out of it, but he didn't try very hard, right? He, as soon as his mom said, obey me, we're doing this. Oh, okay, mom, yeah. Um, so I wonder, in general, how much coaxing does it take in a person's life, any of us? How much coaxing does it take to get us to do things that are outside of God's will? I'm not talking about major sin necessarily, but you know, you get advice from someone, your parent, you know, you're talking to your family or whatever, and they're all like, oh, no, no, no. They don't understand about the Lord, so they're like, no, 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 you don't do that. You, this is what you do. And how much coaxing do they have to do before we're like, eh, maybe they're right. And we do something like that without waiting for the Lord. It happens. And so um, in Genesis 27, 12 through 13, uh, it says, Perhaps my father will feel me and I will uh, seem to be a deceiver and I shall bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said, you know, let the curse be on me. And in, it was on her. Maybe it doesn't seem like a curse, but uh, we'll see in a second. She never gets to see her son again after all of this is said and done. So as a, a parent, a mother, um, a father... It gets to me just thinking to never see my son. That would be a curse, no doubt about it. That would be a curse. And so um, in just this one act of sin here, you know, with Jacob, he blasphemed God, and that is told to us in Chronicles 27, 20. He lied in verse 24, and he gave his father a deceiving and false kiss. You get, do you understand the deception that's going on here? First of all, I don't understand it. I, I get it. Isaac's eyes were, um, you know, he was probably almost blind and so on. And because he, he even said, you know, I can tell by the smell. So they go through all these lengths to try and make sure the smell is right. But still, you put goat's hair on your hand. Was Esau that hairy? Was he like a goat? <laughs> wow. You know, and your dad grabs your hand and he's feeling around and he, somehow he can't tell that it's, it's not real, and he's deceived. There's a, an illustration I want to share with you this morning. It's called, um, There Are Many Varieties of Sin. Uh, in his sermon on sin, a preacher announced that there were 789 different sins. A few days later, the mailman arrived and delivered 94 requests from people in his congregation who wanted to know what they were. That's how people are. I could say... The same thing, you know, there's X amount of sins and people are like, well, which ones? I want to know what they are. Um, people do that so that they can tell if they're breaking any of them and if they're not, they can have, you know, liberty to do whatever they want to. So I think we know from the Word because we studied the Word and we know it well, we know what sin is. There are times when you may question in your mind, Lord, is this really sin? I don't know. But you know, what the, you know what Paul said about that? You know, if you're convinced in your own mind that it is sin, then it is sin to you, where someone else might not. Um, so go with that. Go with the Spirit. And if, if you're being convicted of something that you think is sin, then it probably is sin to you. So what was Esau's response to this deception? Uh, we get that in Genesis 27, 34 through 36. When Esau heard the words of his father... He cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, 
Now, this is after Isaac has been deceived and blessed Jacob. When Esau finds this out, he's, he's broken. He's like, I cannot believe this. How is this happening? Bless me, uh, me also, oh, my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Answer, no. It was one blessing. I don't really understand the, the, the reason, the purpose, um, when it was all about birthright, but now they also have a special, probably spiritual blessing from Isaac as he's kind of passing on the mantle, so to speak, from father to son. And God honors that, and there were spiritual ties to that. And so um, in Genesis twenty-seven forty-one, it says, So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau and said in his heart, The days of mourning from my father are at hand, and then I will kill my brother. Um, and so, you know, what a messed up family this is. Seriously, when you really think about it, it's pretty messed up. You've got, you know, deception, you've got, all, you've got favoritism, you've got all these different things going on in this family. Maybe some of us can relate to that. I don't know what your families are like, you know. I have a wonderful, blessed family, none of that. But a lot of people have a lot of trouble in a family with a lot of siblings and so on. And so maybe you can, can, rela can relate to that. Um, you might be interested to know that in the whole book of Genesis, Esau does not mention the name of God. That's fascinating. Um, I don't know why that is. What, what did Isaac do wrong here? That he didn't bring Esau up in the right way or something? That he never mentions God? Um, and so she tells Jacob, um, Rebecca tells Jacob, well, you need to get out of here because your brother is sworn to kill you. And so he has to run. And yeah, so that's where Rebecca, um, the curse hits because he leaves and she never sees him again. <clears throat> in chapter 28, Jacob flees to uh, Padam Aram in Mesopotamia. That's where Laban lives. Now, who's Laban? Laban is Rebecca's brother. So this is his uncle. And he goes there, and that's where he has his dream. Many of us have heard of the dream that Jacob had of this ladder going up to heaven and angels uh, ascending and descending on this uh, ladder. And uh, so Jacob suddenly kind of has a little bit of a light bulb going on. He's like, hey, there seems to be communication between earth and heaven. This is interesting. And so let's read what the Lord tells him in, in this, in Genesis 28. 15 through 16. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Did you get that? This might, you know, this might be the first time in his life that he realizes God is with him. because He said, I didn't know it. I guess I didn't realize God is with me. How interesting. So God reaffirms you know, to Jacob this promise that was given. And uh, it was given first to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then uh, to Jacob. It's called the Abrahamic Covenant. Do you guys know what the Abrahamic Covenant is? Some do. Not everybody knows what that means. Um, I'm going to read from Genesis 12 uh, to tell you about it. Uh, Genesis 12, 2 through 3. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Um, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed. So this covenant is mentioned probably about a dozen times. Um, and apparently... Um, you know, Jacob doesn't understand that uh, there's this covenant going on. It's being passed down, you know. Jacob uh, should know that because of uh, Genesis 28, I am with you, 
I will keep you, will bring you back to this land, I will not leave you. So all of this blessing is, is on him, and he's still sort of bucking against it here. So when Jacob ran away from Esau, he kind of felt he had run away from God also. And that's what happens many times when sin occurs. Um, you know, if, if there's a major sin in someone's life, they suddenly feel they can't reach out to God. They feel shame, they feel distant, and it's like, I, I can't go to God. When actually what he wants is the exact opposite. He wants you to come, right? It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to come. And Jacob is like shocked that God has been with me this whole time. And so in Genesis 28, 17, he says, um, knowing that Esau's pursuing him, he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So, you know, when people sin, they think God has left them, when actually it's just the opposite. They have left God during that time, and they sin. Um, God is always right next to us, wanting us to return to him. And so we see how Jacob sets up a memorial there in Bethuel, uh, which means house of God. Then in verse 20 through 21, Jacob, um, he comes to a, a, I guess I'd call it a heartfelt, committed, enthusiastic vow that he makes, and it's this in Genesis 28, 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God, is, if God will be with me, he's still stuck in if God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. Then the Lord shall be my God. Um, he still hasn't quite got it. Um, so, the, just this, this vow, he makes a vow, but it's, it's kind of not quite there. Um, if God be with me, um, then he said, you know, the last thing he says, then the Lord shall be my God. If, you know, if he feeds me, if he clothes me, and so on. You, you get it? He, he still is not sure that God is right there with him, even though God just told him he was right there with him. So it sounds, it sounds in some respects like maybe he's had a, an experience. You know, if, if it were New Testament, we'd say he'd had a born-again experience. You know, he, he saw these angels going up and down this, this ladder, and he's... Uh, he realizes, hey, there's communication here between men and God. Um, but he's not quite there yet. He's still struggling to trust and to, to really believe. And so, um, you know, then the Lord will be my God. I wonder if, if people, I, hopefully not you, but I wonder if some people think, you know, if... God, if you would just do this for me, then you'll be the Lord of my life. If you would just change this in me, then you'll be the Lord of my life. Um, for Jacob, he had a thick skull, and I think we do too sometimes. You know, the, the word of God doesn't always penetrate and seep right into a, to our brains, and, and we don't change automatically. Uh, what does God have to do to get through to us sometimes? Well, for Jacob, he had some more things that he had to take him through before he would get it. And so, would it, you know, that, would the dream be enough? You know, would the word of God be enough? Would fulfilled prophecy be enough? What is it going to take for Jacob to finally realize that God is right there and God is in control and that he can submit to him? So, in short, it kind of brings us to the, this wrestling match um, what, what happens in time is Jacob has now run because Esau is vowed to kill him. Uh, he's with Uncle Laban. We know, most of us probably know the story about Uncle Laban. He has two daughters, Leah and Rachel, and Jacob is smitten with Rachel. But Laban pulls some deceit too. So, you know, the apples don't far, fall far from the tree here because in this family too, this is going on. Uh, and so Laban... Uh, kind of swindles him out of Rachel. And there's another story that's a little bit hard to believe. Somehow, you know, uh, Jacob sleeps with Leah instead. And then he has to work. He works seven years to get supposedly Rachel. Instead, he gets Leah. He has to work another seven years to get Rachel. And, uh, you know, 
Then on top of that, Rachel is barren also. And not trusting God um, again, Rachel has her problems too. And that's obvious. She, first of all, decides, I'm barren. Go to prayer, spend time seeking God. No, why don't you take my maidservant, Bilha, and uh, see if you can make a baby with her because I can't. And so he does. And of course they do uh, conceive and have a baby. Uh, just as, does that sound familiar? Didn't Abraham and Sarah do the same exact thing? They could not wait long enough for the Lord. They would not stay consistently praying. Instead, what do they do? They take it upon themselves and Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham and they have a child and which those two children um, would create tremendous turmoil uh, in, the, in the world with their two nations. I'm not really going to continue on, on that uh, train of thought right there, but it looks like the whole generation of this family is kind of screwed up. They, they're godly people. God calls them his people. They're special to him, but they have all kinds of imperfections. They continue to to take matters into their own hands instead of trusting God. And uh, in spite of that, God is working in these generations, in these families. Again, that's encouraging <laughs> for any of us who have, uh, have problems as well. Um, so back to Jacob now. So he's been on the run. He finally um, gets his wife, Rachel, whom he loves. And... Um, when they leave, he's accused of theft, that he took all the wrong uh, sheep with him, and they, he stole them from Uncle Laban. On top of that, Rachel steals the, the home idols. So there's idol worship here as well. And she takes it with him, and she's Jacob's wife. Long story short, um, you know, uh, Jacob does come to have... 12 sons and one daughter. We know that 12 sons, uh, Jacob's 12 sons, are the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And in God's own time, Rachel, uh, God, he did open up Rachel's womb if she had just waited. The two sons that she bore were Joseph and Benjamin. And then Jacob finally um, leaves. And so now we're back where we started. And whew, it was kind of exhausting going through all of these problems that this family has but you know Jacob's been through a lot and you know we all sometimes you know a lot of us have gone through a lot in getting to try and walk with the Lord and so um, you know hopefully our lives aren't anywhere as crazy as Jacob's and our families aren't anywhere as crazy as Jacob's family but then Jacob decides you know he's going to head for for home with his family and look what happens in Genesis 32, 1 through 2. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which means two hosts or two camps. God is doing everything within his power to reach Jacob. First with a dream so that he knows you can communicate with me. And then secondly, he sends them ministering angels because he knows Jacob still is in tremendous fear that Esau is somehow going to catch up with him and kill him. What are these ministering angels, you know, there to do, really? We're not actually told. It's kind of funny. It almost skips right over it. But I'm just going to say they're there to comfort. They're there to strengthen. They're there to encourage. And so... Um, you know, Esau is on the way, and Jacob hears about it. So that's when fear and trembling really sets in. Um, in, in Genesis 32, 7, you know, we learn that. Apparently, Jacob still can't let go and trust. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, you know, through prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. Um, no, not for Jacob. Instant anxiety and fear when he realizes Esau is closing in on him. Um, shouldn't be, but it is. And probably some of us do that too. We worry. I hear people, yeah, I'm a little worried about this. And every time I hear that, I think, be anxious for nothing. We're not supposed to be anxious. We shouldn't be worrying about anything. That's a lack of trust when you have fear or you have 
anxiety. And so we've got to learn to trust. And so here's the lesson for Jacob. Maybe we learn from this as well. So these angels come. They tell him, hey, you know, Esau's on the way. Look at Jacob's prayer in Genesis 32, 9 through 12. Then Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham, and uh, God of my father, Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of these mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and, mer and the mother uh, with the uh, attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your, uh, your descendants as the sand of the seas which cannot be numbered for multitude. So Jacob feels in this prayer, he's, he feels he has to remind God of a few things. That's the way he's praying. Lord, let me remind you about this. You know, he says, uh, remember you told me go back to my country. Remember you said you would protect me and treat me well. Um, is he fully believing God at this point? No, he's still stuck, hard-headed, thinking, I got to do something here. What, what can I do? So he splits all of his people into two companies, and he's arranging them so he thinks, okay, let's, let's put the women and the children out in front, and hopefully Esau will have mercy. And he's, he's conniving and doing all these things. He is truly imperfect, you know, as well we all are. So, you know, he's waiting. The night before he knows Esau's going to arrive, he has messengers that he sent out. He knows that Esau's close. He's within range. He's going to meet his brother very shortly. He's thinking, I'm dead and all my people are dead. And so he's, he's completely filled with fear. And so that brings us back to where we read when we started this whole thing, and that is, uh, brings us back to Genesis 32, 24. When Jacob, when Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. So Jacob is, is still kind of like a child. You know, he's, he's wrestling with Jesus. He's wrestling with God and he's begging for a blessing um, this evening before Esau arrives. And uh, he's grabbed on to his leg. I'm not letting go until you bless me. Even though he's really been blessed all along and God has been right with him the entire time. And so um, Jesus blesses him, but not in the way he thought. Jesus touches his hip and knocks it out of joint. He dislocates his hip and that forces him to surrender finally. Um, so that's not quite the blessing that he was looking for, but um, that makes me think too, why would God wound somebody, you know, when they're clinging to him, trying to get closer and so on? Why would he possibly wound him? And, um, you know, does, does God do that in our lives, wound us in some way so that we will completely surrender that we will, you know, put self to death, that we will finally fully trust. Sometimes a wound is necessary. Now, simple illustration, any of us who had children, we know that if our child runs into the street and there's oncoming cars and so on, we've repeatedly reminded them not to do it, and yet they're kids and they're not thinking and they run out in the street and so on. Um, you know, after so many warnings, eventually, you know, perhaps they deserve a spanking, you know. Some pain, some temporary pain to make the message sink in um, because we don't want them to be hurt truly badly. A little spanking can't compare to getting hit by a car. And so God in our life sometimes, I think, allows painful things for us which to us we can't understand We're like why would you allow this why would you do this and yet he's got absolute purpose in it 
and maybe he is just trying to show us that um, we need to surrender, we need to trust, we need to uh, listen to what he's been trying to say. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a dislocation. I've had a dislocated finger or two. And, um, you know, dislocated joints doesn't mean it's necessarily a permanent thing. So I don't think we're told in the Bible, at least not to my knowledge, um, if that was a permanent limp for him the rest of his life. But we do know that the Jews took that uh, in a special way, and so they won't eat a certain part of the animal that, you know, because of the hip and so on. But, um, you know, was this maybe just a pain for a time, you know, the dislocation? Um, I don't know, I've always kind of had it in my mind that somehow that was a permanent thing, but dislocations aren't usually that way. And so um, God does things that seem really painful to most, most often prevent us from having a worse outcome, more pain or tragedy or so on. And so in verse um, you know, 26 through 28 that we'd already kind of looked at before, um, you know, Jacob said a couple of things. Uh, actually, the Lord said to Jacob, let me go for daybreaks. This must have been some wrestling match. I don't know how long this went on for, but I just cannot get this in my head as to how this would have went. But listen to what Jesus says to him. When Jacob refused, he says, what is your name? You mean to tell me Jesus doesn't know Jacob's name? Of course he does. What he meant is, what is your identity? Who are you? And um, we know that the name Jacob means uh, usurper, supplanter, deceiver, trickster. Um, and Jesus changes his name to Israel, which is translated he who preserves or he who rule as God. And so, you know, many people in the Bible wrestled with God on, on different levels. And probably all of you sitting here have wrestled with God, you know, in prayer over different things. Um, maybe sometimes we need the spiritual spanking. Maybe sometimes God gives us that spiritual spanking. Uh, and we, we don't like chastisement, you know. But I always think of that verse, you know, no chastisement is joyful for the present, but afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit. Um, and from, it goes on to say, by those who have been trained by it. You get that? The peaceful fruit comes when you've been trained by chastisement. The problem is, if you are chastised and you continue, you will receive more chastisement. So you have to learn, and then peaceful fruit will come from that. So, uh, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong at all with wrestling with God. We all do. We all need to. We need to continue in prayer. Never give up in prayer. Oh, yeah, by the way, so what about Esau? What happens when they finally do meet? Uh, Genesis 33, 3 through 4 says, Then he, Jacob, crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. What did that look like? Seven times. Is he like walking and bowing? to his brother? I don't, I don't know. Perhaps, you know, he's, he's fearful. He's like, please don't kill me. You know, I honor you. Um, and he says, until he came near to his brother, but Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau comes with a completely forgiving heart. Jacob has put himself through all of that, all of that, for no reason because he did not trust. He would not take what God said, and he probably never listened to what his mom's prophecy was that, you know, your older brother is going to serve you. He thinks, no, my older brother is going to kill me. So he's still trying his best, um, bowing down to his brother, but Esau comes with a forgiving heart, and that's, that's fantastic. That's beautiful. And so it seems like that's the perfect ending to the story. It's a beautiful thing. The two boys reunite, and um, the family is reunited. It's wonderful. Now, that would be great if it ended right there. It doesn't. Probably after Esau and uh, Jacob are gone from the scene, deceased or whatever, 
the Edomites and the Israelites are mortal enemies. So maybe the brothers forgave each other, but the people, mm -mm, not so much. They were still going to be enemies. Um, so, you know, I know that there's a, a lot of imperfect people out there. I'm one of them, and so are you. And, uh, you know, uh, those of us who have been wounded, we might limp along a little bit, but um, the best advice is grab a hold of that leg. <laughs> And uh, surrender. Surrender. Never let go of him. Ever. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much for who you are. Man, Lord, we're, we have these thick skulls. And we're hard to give in. It's kind of been our training in life that we have to stand up for ourselves and all these things, but Lord, we're your people. There are times when we, we should and can stand up for ourselves. There's other times when we should bow to you, surrender, trust your word, trust what you're speaking to us. We love you so much, Lord God, and uh, I don't ever want to let go of you. I pray that each and every one of us here today, Lord, just hangs on for dear life uh, until you take us home on that glorious day. We love you and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand, please.
praise you, we thank you, we give you glory and honor. And Lord, as much as we hold on to you, we already know that you hold on to us. And what a, a just a joyous thing that is, Lord, to know that you've got us in your hands. We give you glory and praise and honor. We thank you for this day today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you guys.